So last year, we started a series called To Be Continued. Who remembers that? Yeah. And uh, it was based on the book of Acts. And, you know, Acts is um, often referred to, and even the title in our Bibles is sometimes written, the Acts of the Apostles. But if you look at how Luke writes the book of Acts, he writes it as a volume two of his first volume, which is the, um, the Gospel of Luke. And then he writes Acts as a sequel to that. And he starts Acts by saying, in my former book, the Gospel of Luke, I wrote of all the things that Jesus began to teach and to do. Began. Implying, I'm now going to carry on writing about the things that Jesus does. And uh, so where some people want to say it's the Acts of the Apostles, others would say, no, no, no. To be correct, it's actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I want to say, behind all of that, actually it's the Acts of Jesus. Because Luke writes it in a way where he intros it quite clearly to say what Jesus began to do, and I'm now going to continue to speak about what Jesus does. It's not like his work is done and he's out of the picture and someone else is taking over. He's still in full control. And um, so if we get to the end of the book of Acts, chapter 28 has still got this perpetuating theme of the proclamation of the good news of the gospel. It doesn't stop. It just keeps going. And it's got a very open-ended um, kind of way of finishing off. You kind of feel like, did he miss a chapter? Like the, the way it just kind of ends, ends in this like, and then? But I think that's, that's, his, that's his point. There's, there's, there's something of an X, chapter 29. That's us. Because there's still it to be continued. So from the, the book of Luke, there is a continuation of Jesus' work. That's why we're calling it to be continued. And from the end of the book of Acts, there's a continuation that's applicable to us, which is why we're saying it's to be continued. It's a great name, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I thought so anyway. Um, so it's the Acts of Jesus through the apostles and through the church by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. If we really want to kind of say, what is this book about? It's the Acts of Jesus. So we're going to do it in two parts, and we are starting with the second part. So we are going to go from that to be continued to this com to be continued. <laughs> yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? So if we look at the two halves of the book of Acts, what we did last year was Acts chapter 1 to 12. And next week we are going to be starting chapter 13 and going to the end of the book. The first half, what we covered last year, was the formation of the church, the ecclesia. There was something of a pouring out of the Spirit of God, people coming to salvation and gathering together in the temple and in homes, and sharing this common salvation, this unity of the Spirit. And um, they then start to be on mission, and uh, they're reaching kind of like the, 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 the closer circles. And it's exactly what Jesus commissioned them to do. So you will be a witness unto me, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. And that's exactly what we see in chapter 1 to 12. So they're reaching those areas. So it's, it's like this incredible explosion of the presence of God in the lives of people. And as these people live their lives, they're proclaiming the good news about Jesus and uh, his death and his resurrection. And as a result, more and more people are coming to faith coming to salvation, and this kingdom is spreading. 
That was like quite worth it. Yeah. I meant to say, and stop. No. Um, and so it's predominantly a Jewish crowd that, that they're speaking to. And then we see in the chapters 13 to 28, it's often called the diaspora. It kind of like starts already with persecution in the church, but people start to move out. And, and missionary journeys start to move into different spaces. And all of a sudden, you now got something of the ends of the earth taking place. They, they're reaching Asia Minor, Greece, Rome, Paul and Barnabas, and all these guys. They're getting on ships, and they're going places. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's riveting, man. So good. But, but, but it, as you read it, you get something of the fact that there is... Um, a, a call upon our lives far greater than just our lives. Because if it's just about us, what a sad existence that would be. But if it's about the mission of Christ and going and reaching and getting to places where people don't know Him and you get to proclaim the good news of Jesus and people come to salvation... That's why this design of the concentric circles is, is what we went with, because that's exactly what's taking place. Here we are in Stellenbosch. And the kingdom of God is still going to the ends of the earth. This is what we are part of. Well, I'm excited. <laughs> so today I'm not quite going to get into chapter um, 13. I'm just going to do a little bit of a recap of what we um, covered in the first half of the series, which was 20 Sundays. So I hope you don't have any plans for today. Um, <laughs> get comfortable. No, I'm joking. And, and I want to um, emphasize the ascension of Jesus as, as the emphasis of this morning. Who knows it was Ascension Day on Thursday? Yeah? It's amazing how it doesn't get a lot of air time, eh? Weirdly. You know, we're very good at celebrating Christmas and Easter and Ascension. Eh, Thursday. But actually, what a day. What a day. So let's read from Acts chapter 1, from verse 6. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I love how Jesus says, It's not for you to know. And then it says, But which could also be phrased, but it is for you to know. There's certain things we don't have to know. And then there's other things we do need to know. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about dates. But there's certain things that belongs to the Father. He, he'll decide when the second coming is. People who get, get caught up with, when's it going to happen? You get so overwhelmed by that date that you lose sight of the window that you're actually in and what you should be focusing on, that there's a, a presence of the, the Spirit of God in you. There are people around you who don't, and you get like all technical, and this person's saying this, and, this, and, and Jesus is saying, it is not for you to know. It belongs to the Father. But it is for you to know that you will receive power, and you will be my witness. That's what you must know. Then it says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. King James Version actually talks about a cloud received him. It wasn't Luke being kind of preoccupied with weather conditions. You know, it's like the day of the ascension was partly cloudy. No, a cloud symbolizing, symbolizing the, the presence of God. All through Scripture, whenever you see a cloud... Symbolic of God in the temple, Mount Sinai, leading the Israelites day by day, pillar of cloud, and now a cloud receives him. 
He was sent by God. Sent by the Father. Now he's received by the Father. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. I, I, I think I would do the same. It's the one moment it won't be like, squirrel. Like You're not going to be looking anywhere else. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. I don't know about you, but when I read scripture, I, I try and like put myself in the shoes of. Can you imagine that like moment where you're like looking up and there's like Jesus has ascended into heaven, and then all of a sudden, whoa, <laughs> like they're right there. And, and look what they say. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There's something of a, like an angelic question over our lives. Angels ask questions. You know, when they've found their way interacting with human beings, they would ask questions. And, and when, when the guys were looking for Jesus, huddled there around the tomb and where is he? You know what they asked? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for life in the things that bring death? And here they're saying, why, why are you doing some like spiritual stargazing? Like, why are you looking up? As if to say, there's work to be done. Why are you standing here? Why are you stationary? Why are you not moving? This is not about staring up into the sky. This is being watchful about a window that you have. Between Pentecost and the Perusia, there is something of a, a Jesus has ascended into heaven and he's coming back again and there's work to be done. You are his witnesses. Stop staring into the sky. Let's get on with it. So, for today, three things. Because all preachers have got to have three points. Yeah, a little bit of alliteration is also good, eh? The plan, because God has an unfolding plan. And it has a very intentional outcome. I mean, if you go through the, the big moments and, and how it's tied to prophecies and the timing of the, even Jesus coming in to Jerusalem on a donkey was prophesied by Daniel 483 years to the day. Comes in on that day. And, and his crucifixion happens at the time of Passover. And as much as the religious leaders try to like, wangle things and get things to like, hey, let's not do it over this time, because if there's one time it can't happen, it's then, it's exactly the time it happened. Because of all the things that were out of their control, because actually... Jesus was being killed, but he was in full control. He, he was fully submitted to the will of the Father, surrendered in a way that, that these things were happening, milestones in the plan of God, and, and his resurrection, and in his ascension, and Pentecost. It's all planned. God's got a plan. Nothing's taking him by surprise. It's not his plan B, it's his plan A. It's always been his plan you realize like what we are part of? The divine plan. That brings us in and then makes us a part of. Oh, we need to realize this. Then that God is powerful, is powerfully at work. His spirit is empowering and enabling. And then I've kind of covered the third point, that he chooses us. He has personnel. We are his human resource. And he will reach his, his unfolding plan. He will reach those who don't know him through us. We are his means. So let's unpack it, the plan. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. If you look at the completed work of Jesus, incarnation, crucifixion, 
resurrection. Done. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. There is a work that I came to do, and it is done. I have conquered sin. I have conquered death. Done. And with his ascension, just when you think, oh, well, because his work is done, and, and he's now leaving, it doesn't mean that there's no work to be done. There's a continual work. A completed work and a continual work. You realize that Jesus was the first person to work remotely, right? Yeah? He went home. He went and worked from home. He knows the struggles. He knows the benefits. One of the difficulties with people working from home is, you know, it's not always obvious what they're doing. You know, it's like a, the whole thing of, are you really working? It's very comfortable for you to be there. But, you know, like we want to know what's happening. You've got to show that you're working. I find it interesting that we, we sometimes struggle to see the hand of God. We struggle to see things that's actually taking place. But I'm telling you this much. When you open your eyes and when you prayerfully allow God to show you, you will see the evidences of His grace all the time. He's at work. He's drawing people to Himself. Seeds are being sown. People's hearts are being turned. There's, there's something of a conviction taking place, a confession taking place, a conversion taking place. And this ever-increasing, advancing kingdom is on the move. He never stops. You don't have to worry about whether he's working or not. He is working. It's a continual work. And this ongoing work is one of proclamation that we get to proclaim. And people come to a place of conversion. And then when you're in relationship with him, there's this transforming that's taking place. He's always working. By his spirit, he's working. And if you think about the significance of the ascension, if you read the account in Luke 24, Luke talks about the fact that after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, when you first read it, you, you struggle to make sense of that because when, when someone who's very dear to you leaves, great joy is not the emotion you should be having. Is it not like weird for you? Great joy? What? He's left us. Why are we so happy? Well, there's significance in his ascension, and they got it. That's why they were filled with great joy. Let's look at the significance of his ascension. Do you realize that with Jesus ascending into heaven, we have a man in the presence of God? Since the the time that Adam was expelled out of the Garden of Eden, there's never been a man in the presence of God. Adam was in the presence of God. He walked with God in the cool of the day. And when sin came in, and he was expelled out of the Garden, Imagine how all of heaven gasped. Because in that moment, it meant alienation. Out of the presence. Sin is coming in, out of the presence. And Adam is the one that leads us out of the presence of God. Because of sin. And here, a man. Because Jesus is still a man, flesh and blood. He has been raised with a resurrection body, and a man moves back into the presence of God. 
I can imagine how in, in the moment that Adam was expelled out of the garden, that all of heaven gasped. And that at the moment of crucifixion, all of heaven went silent. But in that moment where Jesus went back into heaven, all of the heavenly host erupted with joyous praise. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> and the Bible says he is the first fruit. He is the first one. That the angels within that moment realize this is the first man to come back into the presence of God. And there will be more. And we will be included in the number because if you put your faith in Jesus, you are in Christ and you are with him and you will be raised as he was raised and you will be in the presence of God as he is in the presence of God. Holy, righteous, perfect. The other thing that is very significant is that we have an advocate. There is someone who defends. There is someone who represents. I've used the analogy before, but I'm going to do it again. If you consider being in a cell and you're facing the death penalty and you get yourself a really good lawyer who happens to be a very kind and compassionate man who comes and sits with you in your cell and you get to talk to him about life on the inside, and he comforts you. And every time he's there, he refreshes you. It's great for you. But actually, where you need your advocate to be is not in your cell with you. You need him to be in the court representing you. You're needing an able performance that will defend you. And so this life that we live is a life of confinement. We're not living in the way that God intended, right? We don't have a fullness that, that, um, that he had in mind in, in terms of, of how we would live. And, and because of sin, we are, we are criminals. We, we're enemies of God. We're facing the death penalty. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But we have an advocate who who comforts us and, and, and who is there for us. But more importantly, he's in the courtroom of heaven. He's representing. Every time we sin, the, the epistle of John says, if anyone sins, he is an advocate with the Father. Every time there's something that we do wrong, Jesus appropriates his atoning work. There's never a time where we come out of the favor of God because when we're in Jesus... We are cleansed. We can't do anything that undoes what he's done. He represents us. We have a priest in heaven. We have a man in heaven. We have an advocate in heaven. We have a priest in heaven. You know, there was a... Again, in the account of Luke, Jesus lifts his hands, it says, and he blesses the disciples. It, it's kind of how they would do things as a priestly blessing. Number six, the priestly blessing. They would raise their hands over the people like that and pronounce the blessing over them. And it says, while he was blessing them, he was taken up in the cloud. Do you realize the ongoing posture of Jesus is one of blessing over us? His words to us is, you are mine. I take great delight in you. Your eternal well-being is my greatest commitment and, and the ultimate reality that I am committed to. It's ongoing blessing. Never stops. He's our ascended Savior. And then, beyond just what it means for us, what it means for our purpose in life and, and the significance that we can have is that He's a promise keeper and he promised to send his spirit, and he does. And by his spirit, we have an ability to speak to people that don't know him in a way that is not us speaking, but him speaking through us. And we have a sovereign king in heaven. He's over everything, and salvation belongs to him. And yet he chooses us. 
to be the means with which he would reach others. I don't understand why he would do that. But it is, it is his choice. It is part of his plan. And he entrusts us with this incredible message of reconciliation. So he is our representation in heaven. We are his representation on earth. And this beautiful exchange of Jesus ascending into heaven and then releases this mandate over our lives to reach those who don't know him. What a joy. Then says, but you will receive power. Speaking about the power that we have. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I love reading the accounts of when the Spirit of God came on people in Scripture. It's wild. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just read through the book of Judges. Samson, man, and the Spirit of God rushed on him, and he tore a lion to pieces with his hands. I'd struggle with a hamster. Sorry for the animal lovers, but. <laughs> it's going to get messy, that's all I can say. A lion. Bare hands. Just back leg, head. All oh, the animal lovers are loving this, sorry. My wife is telling me to stop. <laughs> but I'm only saying it because it's in the Bible. <laughs> and, and then you've got um, guys like Solomon who just has this incredible wisdom. He knows everything about plants and fish. And, I mean, he writes these incredible pieces. There's like thousands of songs that he wrote. We just got one of them in the Bible because it's Song of Solomon, not Songs of Solomon, just the one that he wrote. I know when he got the time, like he's a king, he's got stuff to do, but he's writing songs and he's writing Proverbs and it's just wisdom. But you see, when the power of God comes on someone, when God is at work through ordinary people, extraordinary things happen. Not because of the person, but because of the greatness of the one who is working through them. And I just want to say, like, every conversion is radical. I don't like when people say, oh, that person had a radical conversion. In some way, you're actually exposing yourself to not truly understand sin and the grace of God. Every conversion is radical. And every conversion includes not just the promise of forgiveness, but the promise of the fullness of the Spirit of God. It, it, it's that moment when you, when you come to a place of conviction and confession and you put your faith in Jesus with repentance that the Spirit of God enters the soul of man which is why you become a new creation. There is something fundamentally different about you. You are no longer just a natural person. You are a natural person with the supernatural presence of God in you. I don't think we believe it sometimes. I don't think we, 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 we consider it enough. Because if we did, we would realize that there's a confidence that we can have when we get the prompting and, and when we get opportunities to just open our mouths. You know, it's like we're not, we don't have the confidence to open our mouths and so nothing happens. But trust me, when you do, you start to say things. Where did that come from? How, how, did, how did I string all of those things together? There's these incredible workings that takes place. We, we have our minds renewed. This is the power of God's presence in our life. He renews our minds. It's not like a magic one thing. 
it happens over a period of time, but he, he forms and he shapes us. And, and, and I mean, if you've been walking with Jesus for whatever period of time, 10 years, you can look back on it and say, ah, I'm not perfect, but I'm not the person I used to be. He, he renews your mind. He transforms your heart. You have a shift in your priorities and in your values. All of a sudden, like things like money is like, it's not mine. I don't own it. It's like God's blessed me with this. I just get to be a steward of it. And it's about his kingdom. It's about something of eternal significance. And, and all of a sudden, there's a shift that takes place. I'll just use money as an example because it's the first thing I thought of. And it's probably the one that's the hardest when people just open their hearts with generosity, realize that's not you. It's the Spirit of God in you. And He reminds us of the truth. He, I mean, when you read the account of, of Peter and all the guys as they're proclaiming the truth of the gospel, they have this... Um, Ability. I mean, at Pentecost, they all speak in different languages. Like a language that you can understand. They weren't speaking in tongues. They were speaking in different languages. So all the neighboring provinces that had come for the festival that happened at Pentecost, they're like, hey, he's speaking my language. That's where the phrase comes from. He's speaking my language. I'm just joking. Do you, do you see how that's not normal? If I had to just start speaking Italian, you'd be like, hey, where did you learn that? Like, I didn't. Just opened my mouth and oh, out it came. They're speaking different languages. And you know why? Because like, people need to hear a certain language depending on like, where they are at. It's like when you hear, want to hear the wonders of God, it might not be a geographical, geographical thing, but, but like it might be a stage of life that you are in. It might be difficulties that you're facing. And God gives us an ability, a language, to speak to people in ways that only He can. And there's this incredible boldness, just so courageous, with the, the biblical authority that comes. I don't know if you've ever wondered around the, those moments where you see the sermons that took place and there's like thousands of people listening and Peter gets up and he, like, he didn't have an iPad. He didn't even have a Bible. I mean, those scrolls that they had in the temples was like, you know, kind of like, let's open it up and someone's going to read it for you. But how does he quote stuff? He's quoting Joel and... So it's like a biblical authority. He's not referring to notes. And I know what you're thinking. Why have you got an iPad? I don't know. I shouldn't. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm just realizing where I am in my notes. And um, it's not good. What's that? I'm hearing it's becoming a norm. I'm hearing to be continued. It's all right. Part three. So Jesus chose ordinary men. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And the key word in that phrase is you. You, of all people, you. Who, us? Yes, you. I mean, so when Jesus chooses his disciples, he chooses the most ordinary of people. Fishermen. People that weren't really liked. No political influence, no wealth, no... No sway. Nothing. Ordinary guys. 
and, and, and by virtue of what, what we get from historians that wrote in that time, they were invariably very young. Teenagers. 17, 18, 19 years old, most of them. It's crazy that he would choose them. I mean, as he is ministering, there's this um, kind of like their selfish agendas and ambitions start to surface all over the place. And you realize, like, they, they were certainly not perfect. Ordinary guys that at most opportunities had like, selfish tendencies that came to the fore. You know, can I sit by your side? Can I sit at your right hand? Can I, you know, like, let's get the money going. Let's kind of see the money. Let's hold on to the money. I will betray him. Why did Jesus even, like, how does this happen that he would choose ordinary guys who are completely flawed? We just need to go six weeks back from Pentecost and we realize that when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, they're all falling asleep. All he said was, keep watch. And I couldn't do that. During Jesus' trial, Peter's just denying him. I tell you, for like three times, I'm like, I don't know the man. And, and at his crucifixion, barring John, they have all fled. They're all gone. Self-preservation. Fearful and absent. And post-resurrection, when Jesus appears to them, it it's, makes a very clear point that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. These guys were like, Lightweight. They weren't these like strong, bold kind of like let's take. They were like, man, we are cowering away here. We are so petrified that we're going to lose our lives. And Jesus would choose them. The not so stellar team becomes Jesus's A team. I love that. Which means we, we're all in this. And we can't be judgmental towards anyone who comes to faith like God's chosen. Like, they, they're part of it. And you see what happened with them by the time I got to Pentecost? They had lost their, I've got this attitude. They weren't saying, I can do this. They were just all in the room waiting for a power that had been promised. And the reason why they were waiting is because they realized, I cannot do this. They were emptied of themselves, and so Jesus filled them. And I think that's necessary for us, because we can be ordinary but full of ourselves. We need to be emptied. We need to come with humility. We need to come with our knowledge of the fact that we cannot do this. And when I say this, I mean changing a person's heart. Where they will go from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. I cannot do that. And I need to empty any notions that I can play some form of a role in that. And when I do, God empowers me in a way that with the smallest of things, with the, the tiniest of opportunities, I get to speak into a person's life and God does what only He can do. So here we are, 21 generations later. And I feel like there's a divine Acts chapter 29 mandate over our lives to live out this incredible gospel that has been put into each of us the grace of God the glory of God 
we get to be the custodians of that. We get to be the ambassadors of His glory and His grace. We get to be the ones who share the good news with those who don't know Him. Because He's chosen us. 